So my name is Mohsen um, Ghazi Zadeh. I am an Agile coach and um, trainer. Uh, work mainly with uh, mid-sized companies and Fortune 500 companies. And um, I uh, basically uh, have been doing this for the past 12 years plus. So I was introduced to Agile when Agile has just become um, um, a keyword in, uh, in the industry. And uh, through that, uh, basically, uh, I went through um, different courses, just like, you know, many of you guys. I probably took a certified Scrum Master course with one of the early instructors. Um, and uh, from then on, I just stayed in the, uh, in, in the Agile environment because, as you can tell, I believe in what it does. I really like it. I feel it's something that actually benefits companies and individuals. So I do this because I really love it. And that... Uh, has been a great career choice, at least for me, ever since uh, I started. All right. I um, want to quickly um, uh, kind of go through why Agile is important. I, be I believe uh, the first thing is that, yeah, we are in uh, the fourth industrial revolution. That's what they say that we're in right now. And um, a lot of number uh, sectors in the industry are trying to actually go back into becoming agile. Um, the very first sector was technology and then retail and banking went next. And right now, um, I actually have a few clients in this sector of pharmaceutical and energy, which are trying to you know, get started and, and go for uh, a better agile, uh, agile model so that they can actually catch up. But the reality is that only 4% of some of the 2,500 uh, 2, companies surveyed actually have truly made it. This is the part that I always, uh, I love to talk about when I talk to individuals is that when I go to places, most of the time they're like, we're agile. And I ask why, and they say, well, we have standups and we do two week sprints, so we're agile. And the reality is that agility is not really, I mean, those are tools. It helps you become agile. So when you actually have two week sprints, that's great. When you actually have standups, that's very good. But agility as a whole is not two week sprint and standups. And we're going to actually look into that. And, and that's where we're trying to figure out exactly where product management sits in, because that's actually a very important part of this. So if you look at original um, traditional companies and, and, and how they were, um, and here I have actually exemplified companies like Nokia, um, uh, Eastern Kodak, and Motorola. How many of you guys remember you having a Nokia phone? A few of us did, right? And nowadays, nobody really talks about Nokia anymore, really. I mean, even in LA, we had a place that was called Nokia Center. Now it's called Microsoft Center. So, I mean, even to that extent, the name was, was taken away. But what happened with those companies? They were dominant in, in, in where they were. Motorola was a dominant company. That I remember Motorola Razor cell phones were like the, the slickest thing that you could have in the early 2000s. It was like, if you had that phone, you, you were hip. Um, and... Um, you know, the same thing with, with Nokia. Nokia actually made great products. But then what happened? They missed something. And eventually, right now, they're basically phasing out. Kodak, same thing. I mean, Kodak was, to a point, just like how Google is right now. So you would say, hey, you know what? Bring a Kodak. That meant that, you know, bring a camera. And just like now when they said, hey, why don't you Google this or, or Google that or, or things like that. I mean, it was part of the lingo and, and so forth. The reality is that one of the things that they, these guys missed was that they didn't see the change in trends happening. And the change in trend is this. Companies are emerging, startup companies, just like, you know, again, you know, I, I'm, I'm assuming this place is a startup company as well. They are coming in and majority of the time, 
from a product strategy perspective, startup companies, in order to be successful, this is what they do. They look at their competition, and then they look at exactly where the competition is the weakest. And once they identify the weak point of the competition, they go and start competing at that level. And the problem with the competition is that they're so big and so giant that once something very small and agile comes and starts doing offering for their, comp uh, for, for their customers, they can't catch up. They can't necessarily, you know, fast enough, go back and try to mitigate what the gap was that this competition is now trying to compete in, right? So most companies, what do they do? They acquire another company. Majority of the acquisitions are not because the product is such a great product. It's just that the product is really filling a void in my big ecosystem. So therefore, I'm just going to go and acquire them so I don't have to compete with them anymore. So now they're part of me, and I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do with them later. And most of the time an acquisition, of course, we've had successful acquisitions, like, you know, things like, you know, perhaps Instagram or, you know, YouTube or things like that. But there have been failures in the market as well. Um, uh, one of the failures of acquisitions, it was um, when uh, uh, a company called TiVo was acquired. TiVo was acquired because it was a great product, but at the end of the day, it just didn't work out. And it could not, they could not market it, so they had to just put the product into rest, right? Okay. So agile organizations, of course, you know, they're, they, they try to brand themselves as living systems. And the reason that, you know, that, that brand actually works or that terminology works for them is because they're constantly evaluating things. And because their system is so agile, they keep on changing with what they believe their market trend is. This, is, um, this can work at any scale. Uh, I'm going to give you guys another, uh, another example. Like all of you guys have heard of Google. Google is a giant company at the moment. It's very, very big. One of the reasons they're very successful, however, is the fact that the way that the product strategy at Google works is tightly coupled with how they actually you know, look forward to innovation. So product strategy as well as innovation coupled together in an agile model actually creates what Google actually does have from pr perspective of tools or products or offerings or things in, in that sort. Um, how many of you guys have heard of containerization or Kubernetes? It's a, you know, it's a, it's a Google innovation product. It came out in 2014. Back there, somebody was going like this. And a lot of people are actually like this because nobody really knew what was going on with it. But the, the, the technology is really powerful. It brings in a, the right amount of redundancy to your system. It somewhat is competing with something like VMware, for instance, and, and things like that. However, not everybody could adapt it. And, and by the way, Google has basically got it, perfected it for themselves, introduces their product, and they're moving past it because now they're looking for the next thing. Meanwhile, the rest of the industry are trying to actually move towards something that they were at probably five years ago. Okay. Um, Agile organizations, they focus on a customer and market. And majority of the time, customers are embedded within them. They have a very tightly coupled conversation with their customers. And they're open, uh, inclusive, and non-hierarchical. They embrace uncertainty and ambiguity with greater confidence. The reason is that they, the way they look at it is that an, an uncertainty to them is opportunity. It's not weakness. So when they look at uncertainty, they're like, oh, what is it that we can do which is different? And because the model is so agile and so fluid and so powerful, they can actually go back and start implementing it and actually make, make a name for themselves or, or compete. Okay. All right. Generally, I like to say that agile companies are just better equipped for the future. 
Why is this important? Well, because companies want to exist. They don't want to die down. So if you're not equipped to live for tomorrow, you probably have to have an end of life today. This happens on human being level, this is, happens on life level, and this happens on company level. Everybody has to actually think through it from that perspective. Okay, so when you look at definition of agile, everybody agrees that you know, it's about quickness, lightness, and ease of movement. I like this definition a lot, which says agility is defined as the ability of a system to rapidly respond to change by adapting its initial stable configuration. Normally, these are some of the things that I'm going to go back and forth with you guys, but because we are a little bit short in time, I'm just going to probably just, you know, try to um, go through it pretty quickly. Normally, my question is, why is the word system in brackets? And the response I normally get, it's a typo. And it's not a typo. It's actually there for a purpose because there is a definition associated with system. In any agile environment, one of the things that we have to be very aware of is the fact that we have to have system level thinking. And system level thinking is something that is a, definitely a culture shift for majority of the companies. I told you guys that I work mainly with, um, you know, large companies or mid-sized companies. And the reason I do that is because they're the ones that actually need the most help. A company, which is sized you know, between you know, 50 and 100 people, I would be surprised if there is really strong silos in there. You know, if, if, if you're a product, a product manager and you wanna to talk to a dev manager, you probably can find them in the hallway or in a cafeteria. But when you're talking about a company which has got you know, different locations and so forth, a product guy and a dev guy, if they're supposed to talk, they have to set up a meeting and so forth. So agility is, at a different scale and a different level when it comes down to that. But the reality is that this fact doesn't change for any other organizations, no matter what the size is, because you're all a system. The best example I've always been giving about systems is Taco Bell. Taco Bell is a system. Here's how the system works. So basically, um, when you are hungry, hopefully, when you, you walk into a Taco Bell uh, store, and that is when you walk into a Taco Bell system. This is how the system works. You're gonna look at a menu that's in, in front of you. Um, you have to choose items that you wish to have with you know, respected portions and sizes and so forth. You make, an, you make your order. Um, you have to pay. Once you pay, there is a pause in this flow because another system starts right after you actually pay for your order, right? And that inner system goes and starts preparing your food. They take your order, you know, whether it's a burrito, you know, quesadilla, whatever it is, they actually make it, they package it, and they bring it up. And that's when that system is done and your system starts working again because that's when you actually take your order, either you dine inside or you walk outside with your food. Make sense? All right. So the reality is that every system has an input and an output and they actually start working together. And that is important to know. Why do I say that? Well, as a company, if you wanna be agile, you have to have system level thinking because anything that you do in your department is going to affect somebody else. If your department is, you know, let's just say you have an accounting software. If your department is about to, you know, make any change to a form that actually does, you know, accounts receivable inputs, you probably are affecting a report down the stream on your report and you're affecting some sort of a calculation for taxes. So, and they probably are done by a different department. So, System level thinking is you thinking through the fact that when I'm making this requirement, how am I affecting somebody else? Why do I say all this stuff? Because product managers as a whole are key elements that actually make this happen. It says individual interaction over processing tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, 
customer collaboration or contract negotiation and responding to change or following a plan. And then right after that, it says, that is while there's value on the items on the right, you value items on the left more. I guarantee you, if you actually start walking up to somebody who's a scrum master, most of the time, I, I, you know, I, I'm willing to put money on this and ask him exactly, explain to me why items on the left are something that we actually value more. They can't tell you. So today, you guys will find out the answer. So you guys can go back and talk to your scrum masters and hopefully school them a little bit. All right. So in an agile environment, a healthy agile environment has a team tripod. And this team tripod has got three roles in it. One is called a scrum master or facilitator. The other one I call him product owner or product manager and the other one is technical lead. This is the tripod that is needed for any team in order to be successful. We're gonna go over that and we're gonna focus on product owner, uh, the, 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 um, mostly. Um, the reason, um, real quick, I wanna to touch on the Scrum Master um, because majority of you guys probably are in contact with one of them, you know, they run your standups and your, and they're a little bossy probably, right? Exactly. Or some of you guys are, are doing both roles, which is wrong as well. But that means that, you know, that's, uh, things are not set up correctly. So a scrum master is a facilitator at heart. A facilitator is at, at its core has to be able to have system level thinking and understand end to end how things are working. Problem is majority of the companies when they decide that they wanna go agile, somebody comes to them, probably a coach like me and says, are you a project manager? They're like, yeah, well from now on you're a scrum master. And guess what? All you have to do is you set up a 15 minute meeting on a daily basis, you ask people what they did, you try to resolve impediments, you run a meeting every couple of weeks, and you get six-figure salaries, yay! And you don't have to do a lot of PMI work on things like that when you were doing the PM, you know, project management, you know, traditional stuff, because we're agile. We don't do documentation and so forth, you know. Wrong stuff. <laughs> this is a misunderstood rule, but again, this is a product management uh, school, so I'm, I'm gonna try to focus on the next one as much as possible. This is majority of the time the conversation that a product manager has with a VP. When can you get this done? We'll get it done tomorrow. This is what's important about a product manager when it comes down to a role in an agile environment because as a product manager, you have to be able to articulate um, to people who are doing the work what is it that they're supposed to do and help them with information so that they actually help them and hopefully your project manager or your scrum master helps facilitate this exercise so that through these informations they can get better estimates so they know exactly when they can do this stuff. So why do we want a plan? That's a separate subject, but let me tell you one thing. When you guys plan properly, you actually reduce risks for your environment. You actually reduce risks for your, um, for your products and for your teams. Every time we plan properly, we you know, enable ourselves to actually do a better and, and higher quality delivery. There's two roles that I, I need to talk about, it, and one is called the product owner and the other one is called product manager. And I want you guys to remember Problem is most people believe product management is a better role because it's got the management, you know, word in there. At one point, I was actually hiring for, for, for a product owner role in a, com in a company. And we're going to go over these two real quick. But it was interesting because I went through certain interviews and I would ask people, I'm like, um, I, 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 there were a couple of candidates that were thinking that, okay, they're, you know, we want to bring him in for a in-person interview, but I needed to actually make sure that they are okay with this. 
So I'm like, you have to understand that this role, when you come in and if you actually get it, the title is going to be a product owner, not a product manager. Are you okay with that? They're like, no. I'm like, why? It's like, I like product manager. I'm like, I get it, but you agree that the role is a product owner role. And yeah, I get it, but I like the title product manager. So literally this one lady, she actually didn't accept the invitation for an in-person interview because she's like, I'm a product manager and I want that same title. That's an issue with the industry, so you know, be okay with it. Let's figure out exactly what's the difference between these two. So a product owner is solution and technology team facing, contributes to the vision and program backlog, owns team's backlog, defines iteration, accepts iteration, derives iteration goals and iteration content. Basically, if you are a, in, a, in a role which is team facing, meaning that on a day-to-day -day basis, you're actually working with the team <coughs> and the delivery of product is important for you. And your objective is to make sure that we deliver the value that we have said that we would deliver, then your role is a product owner. Product manager, on the other hand, is of course, market and customer facing, identifies market needs, works with marketing and business development teams, owns the vision, roadmap, program backlog, derives release objectives, and establishes feature acceptance criteria. Basically, a product manager is facing outward towards the customer, towards your market, towards your competition. And these two roles have to actually work back to back. They actually work together, but it's two different and distinct roles. If you want to be set up for success, you must have these roles fully established and they need to be distinct. Because if you tell somebody that you have to go to customers, do demos for customers, get customer requirements, and come back and also work with the team, you're basically setting them up for, for failure, not success. And most people take that on. The problem is this. Most of the companies that I've been to, a product manager, <coughs> they actually take this on as as, as what they believe is their role. And what's, what, they, what they don't realize is this. Every time we don't properly um, you know, a, a, a give a team a requirement, we don't set them up for success. We just don't. And the worst thing that you can do with an engineering team is when you actually allow them to guess. Because an engineer by heart is the guy who wants to create. And a guy who wants to create, that creation is a never ending thing. They always, you tell a, 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 an engineer to factor a code, he could factor that code forever. Because there's always a faster way, right? Somehow somebody has to stop them. And in this case, this is why this, this work, uh, the, the tripod, of working with product and engineering and, and, and project manager is management is very important. Okay. So product owner is the what person tells people what to do. It's important to stay at that boundary as well. Whether you're coming from an engineering background or a business analyst background, I really don't care. If I, if I was a bun who's, who was, who was going to train a, a product owner, I would not care what their background is. I would tell you later on as far as what I care they know, but I really don't care about their background. As long as they stay within what they want. The worst thing that can happen is when the product owner starts telling people how to do it. That is exactly where there's going to be conflicts. And at the end of the day, it's going to just basically, I mean, in this case, meshing the two um, roles is not good. Just like how I'm not a fan of having a project manager and a product owner doing the same, be, be done by the same individual. I just am not. I know organizations, sometimes they let go of a project manager and they don't hire one. You know, like this person can do it. Most of the time it's a short-sighted um, um, decision on their side because they're like, oh, well, so-and-so, well, they have time. This is nothing, you know, they can do this and so forth. The reality is that the real, the, 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 the 
the actual role itself is a full-time role and they have to properly train and accommodate for it, okay? So PO serves as customer proxy, writes epics and user stories in accordance with program objectives. These two are very important so that we can actually, uh, you know, writing user stories are important. Right before we start this session, there was a gentleman here who, you know, we were getting coffee back there. And he was like, you know, I want to tell you something about, you know, we're agile. It was, I think it was talking about this place. And I'm like, awesome. And then it's like, but you know, sometimes when you're trying to, you know, create a form for people, creating a form doesn't really need a user story, does it? And I'm like, oh, it does, in my opinion. And I articulate for him why you need, an, you, you need something written as far as a requirement. Every time you don't specify a requirement, and, and, I'm not, and I'm not advocating for like, you know, writing like pages and pages of requirements. I'm talking about high level stuff. You want to make sure that you, you stay at a high level. This is the part that when you do workshops and you do training and, and all that, that's where you actually start getting a hang of it. So what's the right way of writing a user story? But every time you allow anybody to guess you're basically setting yourself up for, for a nightmare. Because you're like, you told me that this form is only have, it has to only take, you know, first name, last name, and, and an address. It's like, no, I told you phone number has got to be a part of it. Well, I didn't know that. Well, I told you. And the worst thing is that conversation. I told you, and I know you didn't. Write it down. That's why user stories are there. User stories gives you that scope. You want that scope in order to properly demo and properly show work and the result of what you've done. So as a product manager or a product owner, and both of these, I mean, again, depending on what role you decide to play, this is something that you do in order to create focus for your teams. Your teams, without these, they cannot do what they're supposed to do um, in order to uh, deliver products. Another thing that a product owner has to do, and this is very important, is make trade-off decisions. There's going to be a time that you are standing in, your, in front of your team and your team is like, you know what, we got only a week left and we can't do everything that you are asking us to do. What do you want us to deliver first? That is a very legitimate question. A product manager or a product owner, as they are standing in front of their team, they have to be able to make that trade-off decision. And you can never make that trade-off decision if you don't understand what your priorities are. And this is a very, very big statement. I have gone to companies, and I'm sure you guys have experienced this. They're like, this project is our number one pri priority. Awesome. Oh, by the way, this one is also our number one too. I'm like, you cannot have two number one priorities. It just can't happen. Every time I hear that, what that tells me <clears throat> from, a, from a coach perspective, that tells me that that company or that group doesn't have enough criteria to evaluate, evaluate priorities. And that is not cool. Because every time you have two number one priorities, you create conflicts. And that conflict by itself is an impediment to delivering proper value for, for, your, for your company or for your system. So remember, everything you do as product managers in any environment, if you want to be agile, your job is to create focus. Every time you focus and you create focus for the teams, teams deliver. Every time you take them out of focus, the teams will fail. And the only reason they fail is because they don't know what to work on. So they try to do two things at the same time. I always tell people, this is interesting. We, we make claims at times that, yeah, I'm a multitasker. Okay. <clears throat> so my personal belief is that we as human beings are not multitaskers. The only multitasker that I know or I have seen are mothers with their newborn babies. Other than that, we are very much a single-threaded beings. 
And every time, I personally, I can never multitask. I could never do it. I mean, people will read right through me when they're on the phone and I'm doing something, I run on the phone and I'm doing something else and I'm trying to talk to them. They're like, are you looking at something different? I'm like, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I just give it away. But the reality is this. This goes into, because an organization is made up, made up of people. So if you don't provide them with the proper priority and proper, proper focus, they can't deliver, okay? All right, so I talked about value because as product managers, you guys will be responsible for producing value for your customer or for your company. And here's what I want you guys to remember as definition of value. Value is planned in conference rooms like this. That's when you get together and you talk about what you want. It's developed when you actually hand that, you know, plan or, or requirement to your, de uh, to, your, to your developers and they start doing work with it. But it's only realized and manifested where somebody pays for it. No matter what you create, if nobody buys it, we got problems. <laughs> you can have the best kicking ass, you know, uh, application. But if nobody is planning on actually pay a dollar for it, then it has no value. Now, you guys, I'm not going to go through this uh, uh, exercise, but you guys have heard about uh, minimum viable products. Some of you guys have heard about that. Very good. The sole reason that minimum viable product caught on and people are now starting to you know, use it, at least the, the terminology is something that everybody is, uses a lot. But the application of it is when I go to companies, I realize that the application is somewhat not, um, it's not pr properly defined. The whole purpose of it is to be able to test to see what is the stomach of your market for what you're about to actually put out there. Now, minimum viable product is something that you're doing when you're when you have established company with proper customers and so forth, and you're trying to ensure that your product roadmap is in the right direction. Minimum viable product also applies to innovations, but it's a slightly different thing. We're gonna touch on that towards the end of my slides. However, I want you guys to remember, for instance, if Steve Jobs was going to do minimum viable product on iPhone in 2007, probably iPhone would not have taken off the way it did. So you have to understand that as product managers, your vision and how you articulate what is the minimum that I need to actually test the market with right now is very, very important. There is a company uh, which have been branded with the pioneers of Android. I don't know if you guys, um, and, and my memory sometimes just completely skips me. This is a company that was established in 1994. They created something that was very close to what Palm Pilot was, but that was before Palm Pilot started. And I can't remember the name, sorry. These guys, what they had, it was a spinoff of Sony. It was fantastic. The product was great. The product was actually very, very much ahead of its time. However, what happened was that when they actually launched the product, only 3,000 of it was sold. And uh, there's a documentary on this in Showtime if you actually want to, uh, and I'm going to remember the name finally, and I'll tell you. If you watch it, the product guy, who actually articulated uh, and, and put, put the, you know, had the whole idea basically um, envisioned and, and put it through and, 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 you know, had the engineers work on it. When he talks about it, he's like, when the 3,000 people bought this, when I looked at the names of the people who bought it, I could actually, you know, make out every single one of them because they were all either my friends or family and nobody else bought it. So, you have to also understand that as product owners, there is a leap of faith as sometimes that you guys are working towards. And that leap of faith, it's always better if you have 
better market data and better perception data of your customers before you actually go forward. It's a separate subject to actually talk about R&D and how R&D falls under, you know, on your shoulders and how you can actually best make better decisions in order to successfully do an R&D project. I just wanted to touch on that here because again, all of these encapsulates what a product manager does. Okay. All right. So um, here is the business model of an agile environment and the involvement of um, product, uh, product management role in it. And in this case, I'm actually referring to product owners. So you have business, which if we were originally look at our the definition, business or business analyst was going to be that product manager who was looking outside into customers and market. You've got the product owner here, you've got technology, and you've got what you actually put out in the production world, right? So business talks to the product owner or product management talks to the product owner and tells them, hey, this is what I want. Product owner goes back to technology teams and they're like, well, here is what's coming down as far as a requirement for us to start building. Technology responds back with, well, this is how we're gonna do it. Remember, these are the how guys. Product is the what guy. When this is when we're gonna, uh, uh, you know, send it back and uh, here are the risks. There's always risks associated with, with any product development. The same thing gets, you know, communicated to business. Business then, you know, understands the how, when, and risks. And they finally say yes, and technology goes to work, and they put something in production. Once something is in production, it reports back to the product management or business in a form of growth, revenue, or footprint, whatever was the goal of that product to begin with. Meanwhile, production also reports back to the product owner in form of enhancements and defects. So check this out. Product owner has got the most amount of flashes pointed to it. So one of the requirements that I always say, if you're going into product, if you want to become, and we have you know, somebody here who wants to actually make a career choice, you have to be bilingual and you have to understand technology and you have to understand business. That is what makes a, a, you know, a good product owner. If you understand how you're impacting your company and how you can you know, collaborate with, with your technology team to actually deliver uh, the features, you're home. And by the way, this slide is part of my Agile training. So I always say Scrum Master sees the end-to-end -end facilitation of this. That's why, you know, if they're actually truly at the core of their role. Okay. So let's go back to the Agile Manifesto. Remember, we, we reviewed it at the beginning. And I told you guys nobody could actually say why these things actually are the way they are. So we have the four... Um, pillars or the four uh, definition at the beginning. This is what it says later. So individual interactions is basically when you create your stories and your storyboards. That's when you actually put together that individual interaction. That's when you discuss them. That's, that's when you estimate them. That's when you actually try to collaborate in delivering them. Working software is your MVP. You do the MVP you evaluate, then you do the next chunk, and then you evaluate, and then the next one, and the next one, right? Customer collaboration is when you do planning, sprint, and demos. Majority of the time when you do a demo, hopefully you invite your stakeholders and customers, and they get to comment on it, and they get to see it, right? And responding to change is when you actually do your iterative development. So this is what it means in Agile Manifesto when you read those four lines. Now you guys know more than 99.9% .9 of the agilists out there. Okay. How to execute as a product manager and product owner. Again, I want to, this is a very, very high level summary of, of this role within an agile environment, but I really want to make sure that if you guys leave here, at least you have something to work with. So 
Define roles and responsibilities. When you go back to your organization, try to figure out where you stand. Are you a product manager or are you a product owner? Are you customer facing or are you team facing? If you're doing both of them, have a conversation with your boss. And then you can have him call me and I'll tell him. That's another thing, right? <laughs> know your product. Why? Because you have to be able to do system level thinking. You have to understand what your product does. Know your system. Of course, because your product, whatever you're responsible, whatever you're responsible for is affecting the entire system as well, right? Know your prioritization criteria because you have to be able to prioritize properly. Have a prioritized backlog. Remember that you are a what and why, not a how. Don't tell people how to do it. Tell them why they need to do it and what you need, okay? All right, provide focus, be present with your team, and I know there is one more. Demo as frequent as possible. Demo it. The more you show, the more you show visually what has been developed, the better your, the quality of your product is going to be at the end, all right? And I always tell people to celebrate your success. Be happy that, hey, we finished this. Make it visible. Okay, so as an Agile team, how do we execute if we actually were to go forward with it? I always tell people to um, understand your system uh, view, define roles and responsibilities, know your customers. Hello. Decide what's, what's right for you. Take the time to plan and estimate. Do not compromise your retrospectives. Measure yourselves. Be transparent. Ask for help. And celebrate your success, okay? This is an agile environment as a whole. All right, I want, to guy, I want you guys to also uh, see a couple of slides. The next three slides are basically just food for thought and hopefully for future conversations and future talks. This is a quote by Henry Ford. It said that if I had asked people what they want, they would have said, I want a faster horse. This is what's neat about being a product manager and you, uh, you have, uh, having a vision is important. A product manager with a vision is somebody like Henry Ford who can actually come back and change the entire world. 